Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. This is the fifth and final episode of the 1930s science fiction podcast miniseries that uh, we've been doing. And I hope that you've listened to the other episodes. Uh, We've got uh, Chamblo by C.L. Moore. Uh, We've got Who Goes There by John W. Campbell, Rule 18 by Clifford Samack, and Alas, All Thinking by Harry Bates. Go back and listen to those episodes. Now, I do want to point out before I introduce my guests that you can listen to the audio of this episode. We'll do our best to describe the visuals, but this is one that you might enjoy watching on YouTube just to see who's laughing at any given time. Or most importantly, I am going to have visual aids at some point here in the middle. Um, the other thing you could do is just listen to the audio and then go find those uh, that part later if you really want to see what it was. Um, I have two very uh, important special guests here today. Uh, One of my oldest uh, homies of Lovecraft in fiction, uh, Mr. Cody Goodfellow, the author of Un-America, the Wonderland Award-winning Un-America, and uh, Perfect Union, which is going to be uh, reissued soon, right? Um, Uh, Yeah, end of this month. End of this month. Mm-hmm. And uh, Perfect Union is uh, one of my uh, all-time favorite horror novels. It's it's uh, it's it's really great. And I'm not just saying this to pump up my guest. I love A Perfect Union. And Cody has um, long been um, a Lovecraftian fan, know-it-all, and actually hosts the Cthulhu um, Prayer Breakfast at ne- Necronomicon every year. Um, he's the reason I met one of my writing partners because we protested the um, Bap- uh, Westboro Baptist Church at uh, Comic-Con uh, in be- on behalf of Cthulhu. So, Cody, welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. It's good it's, to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here, David. Thank you. And uh, if you want to hear more about Cody's career, I did do an interview with him on the Dickheads podcast, my other podcast, and I recommend that interview he also was on our Simulacra episode. Um, and also joining us today um, is Fred Lubnow, who is a scientist and does a blog on Lovecraftian science, uh, recommended to me by Cody. Um, and I loved the idea of having somebody with more of a scientific background for this story because one of the things about At the Mountains of Madness is a lot of times you know, everyone knows that it's a horror fiction story. You, you get that. But a lot of times you have to remind people that it's a science fiction classic. Um, and that's what we're here to do is to talk about it as a science fiction story. So we're going to start off by talking about the history of Lovecraft um, and the man. Uh, uh, warts and all, we're going <laughs> to we're going to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> Lovecraft was a man of his time, but he grew up in Rhode Island. And one of the things that's really interesting for me, or one of the first things that jumps out to me about his childhood and that I think is important is that his, both of his parents were institutionalized at one time. Um, yeah. And I think that that's a really important thing. Uh, his father, when he was very young and um, they lived off, his grandfather was wealthy and well-to-do. And, um, but then his mom was institutionalized in 1919. Um, I'm wondering what you guys think is really important about Lovecraft's childhood, because I I admit, I don't know as much about, I can go on all day about Philip K. Dick, but I don't know as much about Lovecraft. So uh, starting with Cody, what do you think is really important about Lovecraft's childhood that maybe feeds into this, this particular work? Uh, Fred or? Oh, no, either one of you. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, uh, yeah, as, as you said, um, Lovecraft's childhood was framed by uh, his father's untimely death. He was a traveling salesman, contracted syphilis, uh, and uh, he died of full-blown paresis, uh, screaming mad at an institution. Uh, His mother was always overprotective. Uh, uh, 
completely, uh, completely sheltered him from the outside world. Uh, he had health problems, but they were certainly exacerbated by his mother. And he was plagued by psychosomatic uh, illnesses uh, throughout his life. Um, it made him very extremely frail and also gave him this extreme fear of corruption of uh, because his, his mother, you know, must have inculcated into him this, this fear of uh, fear of, of, of women and possibly sexual intercourse, uh, which eventually it infected her. Uh, and uh, so she died, uh, you know, un under the same conditions and uh, he ended up living with his aunts. Uh, afterwards until he married Sonia Haft Green and had a disastrous foray uh, try, uh, living in New York. Um, mm -hmm. That was, uh, I mean, it, so his childhood, uh, he had no formal education. He was educated at home. He was, he was self-educated. He was a rather a prodigy, but uh, his, his grandfather's private library uh, and later public libraries uh, shaped his whole understanding of the world. Uh, he hoped to become a scientist uh, and applied to Brown University. He wanted to be an astronomer, but they, they could find no actual educational record for him. So, of course, he wasn't admitted. This dashed his hopes. Uh, and he never aspired to be a writer. He never aspired to be an artist. He always thought of it as a gentlemanly pastime. Uh, for, for a living, he worked as a ghostwriter uh, and, uh, largely re completely rewrote, uh, uh, other writers' submissions, often bringing them into what he called the Cthulhu mythos and, um, and getting them published. Uh, but the bulk of his, of his writing output was in letters. Um, uh, it, by 1931, when he writes, uh, at the mountains of madness, um, he had uh, become a sensation and a staple in weird tales, um, but he uh, uh, many of his best stories, including at the Mountains of Madness, were initially rejected by uh, weird tales about which later, uh, more later. But um, uh, up to that point, his work had always been overshaded by this uh, aspects of the Gothic. He was still very much a uh, uh, kind of a slave aesthetically to uh, Poe and then to Lord Dunsany. Uh, and he had a period of writing fantasy stories um, with uh, Shadow over Innsmouth and uh, at the Mountains of Madness, which he uh, both uh, of which he finished in 1931. Um, he was pivoting towards his own unique view on the universe. And it was, as you say, science fiction, but still infused with this very powerful aspect of psychological horror that was unique in uh in that field because so much of science fiction is is at that time is swashbuckling golden age stuff like the lensman and, and and things like that and it's about man going out and conquering the stars and it's they're basically wild west in space uh stories with the with the aliens standing in for the indians uh lovecraft reasserted this sense that 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 you know the alien is just that and it's in completely unknowable and uh and brought fear uh back into science fiction and uh so many things hit on so many levels uh as far as his psychological motivations his his you know terror and fascination and repulsion with the natural world he was absolutely terrified of the sea it and, seems like his father would have been a huge in his mother like getting these diseases and going yes. mad from it yeah. such a yeah. huge ingredient of what yes. makes him in yeah yeah, yeah and, and well and i was going to say he was also uh very badly affected by and terrified of cold mm -hmm. um he was uh he believed himself to be what they call poikilothermic and uh, that he was unable to regulate his internal body temperature. And he was most comfortable uh, in temperatures of about 90 degrees, which Rhode Island only hit, uh, you know, a couple of months. He would have he would have been a big fan of global warming. Um, but uh, <laughs> right. uh, but he he had incidents where the temperature fell and he collapsed on the street and had to be resuscitated in a pharmacy before. So the the, the nature of 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 uh, the setting uh, in at the mountains of madness playing such a strong uh over overweening role that was something that he was deathly afraid of even more than any ordinary person and and it was literally for him a descent into hell and i and so i think in in that way a lot of the unconscious drives 
that uh, that he put in. I, I, I think the Shadow over Innsmouth is absolutely uh, a, a grand tour of his fears of corruption and his fears that uh, his that his heritage, his pedigree contains some horrible curse that's going to unfurl. And right. And that does come out in at the mountain, mountains of madness on a on a grander scale. Spoiler alert: this finding out that this horrible, unthinkable thing that you can barely conceive of, uh, let alone bear witness to, uh, is actually where you come from, is something that comes out in both it, uh, in these in both of these stories uh, on a on a very intimate and on a very global scale. Now, um, I read that one of the stories that really inspired his like love of and or wanting to write about antarctica was one that he read at the age of nine called uh the frozen pirate by uh-huh. m clark russell which i admit i've never heard of before right this is listed as one of the as a kind of a swashbuckling story that takes place in the uh, uh, up there and i looked it up and i i kind of looked i thumbed through it and i i kind of grazed it a little bit just not knowing i didn't have time to do this but it's interesting that because I think much more so when we look at these authors from this era, we always read things about what they were reading as kids. Yeah. And a lot of them, including Lovecraft, were authors that, you know, like C.L. Moore was another one who was a sickly kid who was given yes. books because she couldn't go out and play with the other kids. Right. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, authors from the early 20th century, we hear the same thing that they were sickly and then sticking in and, it's interesting. I did not know that he wasn't formally educated at all, that that he he taught himself how to read all this. Can you imagine that if he had a more formal education? Yes. Oh, yeah, he, um, yeah. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, he um, I mean, he did attend high school, but he didn't graduate. Um, yeah. From what we understand, he could read at five. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, a lot. He read uh, the Arabian Nights as a kid. Yeah. Um, he loved Greek and Roman mythology. Um, and even like he really got into one of his first loves in terms of science was chemistry. He was fascinated. I think it, I think it was his, um, it was either his grandfather or his grandmother. I think it was his grandfather had a big textbook on chemistry and he was fascinated by the illustrations of the Earl Meyer flasks and all the apparatus. And I think his grandmother had a book on astronomy and he really got into astronomy then later. So he he would hop from science to science. He did read a lot, you know, of, of literature and a lot of fiction, but he also wrote, um, he also, um, he also read a lot of uh, science. And matter of fact, a lot of his writing early on were articles on astronomy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, there was that volume three of, of science uh, from Hippocampus Press that it, it almost all of it is, are his articles in astronomy. And then just to touch on something, you know, one of the, another, story that influenced him was the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket uh, from Poe. And, you know, I, like you're both saying, I mean, Poe was a god to him. He really, he re- and, and you can see that in his early tales. He really tried to emulate Poe quite a bit. Yeah, I had, I had that one in my notes and we'll come back to influences a little bit later. But um, it's funny too, because if you look at when he started publishing with Weird Tales, it's only seven years after his mother's uh, institute or when his mother was institutionalized I, i'm not sure when how much further away she died but um that's only a seven-year period which you know is a short amount of time to go from just writing these kind of you know essays like later on in life he would have been a zinester but at that time you know he's he's you know i don't know where he's sending these articles before weird tales exists right like i don't know what he's doing with them but he's writing these pieces about science how well do they hold up uh, um you know it's interesting because you know they, they are fascinating i mean he um a lot of them are just basically um recaps of um things occurring in the heavens so and like he would he would send routine and regular articles to newspapers and they would publish them and and he would he would just describe what stars you could see in the sky in in uh, autumn or October, and he would mention you know the Pleiades when the Pleiades showers would would occur. He would mention when you could easily see Saturn and Jupiter, and and you know with binoculars and telescopes. And so it was a lot of it is very dry. But then he he has a couple articles like he'll have this one that's really 
it's really a lot of fun called, you know, is there life on the moon? And they were talking about how, you know, when you look at the moon, you see some of the shading. Maybe there's some lichen on the moon somewhere hidden. Um, he has a really interesting um, article on whether man will ever get into space. And, um, and this is just in my brain because I, I was talking about it, about a, a presentation I gave on Kenneth Sterling, who's someone he wrote a, a, a story with. And um, he was saying, well, I think we could only get to the moon if we had like a giant gun to shoot someone to the moon, <laughs> or if we could have some sort it's of anti-gravity. from what they did. Right, <laughs> some sort of anti-gravity or if uh, some sort of electrical repulsion. Those were his three hypotheses of how to get to the moon. Yeah, I'm, at some point I wanna do a series on pre-moonshot, moonshot science fiction novels because mm -hmm. I think they're really fast. Don Wolheim wrote one. I know CL, CM Kornbluth wrote one, but I've already, I've already got the Kornbluth one. I, I don't have the, the Wolheim one. It's gonna be harder to find. Um, but I, I do think that that's really fascinating that he was writing about moonshots before. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, that's really cool. And as a stargazer and somebody who's looking at those, the same skies, he, he had a lot less light pollution to deal with than we. Mm -hmm. So he probably saw more. Um, but uh, that that's really cool. Um, I did not know that. But uh, okay, so uh, anything else about his childhood, or can we move, or shall we move on to weird tales? I think the one thing I'll mention, and I think it, he was a teenager, maybe in his early twenties, but he contemplated suicide. He was actually going to throw himself off a bridge into a river, and one of the, there were a couple reasons why he decided not to, but it basically came down to knowledge to to knowing how the universe operates um he was always fascinated with the old and the ancient um with science and with literature and, and he decided not to kill himself because he wanted to know more yeah and he had a really tortured childhood but i guess cody i guess you would I mean, I feel like if he didn't have this tortured childhood, maybe we wouldn't have the alchemy of all the things that make Lovecraft Lovecraft. And, um, you know, we obviously see such value to the things that he wrote that, um, sorry, Howard, you had a real rough go of it, but, you know, I think it's interesting that we ended up with the things that we got. I wonder how you feel about that, Cody. Oh, you're muted, Cody. Yeah, I didn't want to make like uh -huh um and, and, and yes sir noises during during Fred's thing. But uh, yeah, I it, it's I mean, as with any artist, uh, yeah, a lot of the painful events in their lives uh, shape them and shape their creativity. Uh, and it's it, it's very easy to looking at Lovecraft's life uh, to conclude that had he had, you know, happier circumstances, a more stable home and the support so that he can pursue an education um yeah he might never have written fiction at all um yeah. certainly his his aspirations lay towards science and if he would have gotten uh more concrete support in that realm yeah uh, he probably would have would have dither, would have dithered with fiction um i mean he I, I, as you said at the beginning, that he was a man of his time, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, uh, he was in his in his very regressive attitudes. But he was actually very, very forcefully conservative even for his time, and felt that he would have and should have been uh, uh, far happier as like a, a minor minor aristocrat in 17th century England. Mm -hmm. You know, building follies on his estate, studying studying the stars with his own telescope, uh, and um, Never yeah, and I really, remember. I uh, think I heard you say once, Cody, that it that it's kind of kind of false to say to just write off. He was a man of his times. That yeah, that that Lovecraft was a little bit. I mean, oh. there was more progression around that time than yes. people are giving credit to when they say that. Yeah, yeah. No, he he. A lot of his uh, his output in amateur journalism and his letters are rife with. Uh, regressive xenophobic uh attitudes uh that uh would have been risible uh to a lot of uh people americans of good faith uh even then 
and right. and and here's and here, here's the thing is that if not for his xenophobia and if not for his utter failure to make a life and build a home with Sonia Haft Green when he moved to New York City, uh, uh, his uh, even if he was writing fiction, he might have continued very uh, continued writing uh, gothic horror stories and Dunsanian fantasies uh, and not created the Cthulhu mythos because. Uh, it, it, say what you will about trying to separate the art from the artist, but uh, Lovecraft's creation of the Cthulhu mythos was a direct response to uh, his experiences in New York City and finding himself packed cheek by jowl on, on subway trains and, and on street corners with these, these immigrants from these strange nameless climes speaking these strange languages and thriving in a place where he was completely failing. And so it was very much a of a piece with this notion that uh, this world wasn't made for for him, wasn't made for us, and that the those for whom it is made and who do seem to succeed here must have made some sort of unspeakable pact with these dark forces that are at the root of and the hidden face of all that we we ignorantly call nature. And uh, you know, Call of Cthulhu is is uh, unmistakably just this panorama of of xenophobia, of attributing these hideous, nameless rights uh, to to people of color all around the world. That's what binds them together. Um, with at the Mountains of Madness, he was pivoting towards a more uh, uh, a more measured and grand epic approach and creating these uh, these species that were not in and of themselves monstrous and shocking and horrible, but just incredibly strange. And I think it was only in that point as he entered his uh, entered his forties and what would be the the last decade of his life, uh, during which his out output was sharply diminished for a lot of different reasons besides his health, but also. Uh, he was digesting that xenophobia and digesting those influences and turning back towards a sense of wonder. And, and that is what makes at the mountains of madness, such a, uh, uh, such a promontory and such a, uh, a milestone in his output in that it shows that he was looking into the face of the strange on a deeper level than other people and, and starting to not flinch and starting to actually searchingly try to understand the other. And, and that's what, what really makes that, that wonderful is that uh, apologists for Lovecraft often say, well, he was turned off by Hitler in his last days. And, oh, he was, he was traveling more and he probably would have broadened and eventually, you know, become a Roosevelt Democrat. Uh, um, but uh, I, I don't think that is so, but it does show that in spite of all of the, all of the shit sandwiches that he was given to eat in his life, that he was still trying to grow and evolve. And mm. yeah, it's hard not to wonder what would have come if he would have had a little more support, you know, in his, in his writing career and, yeah. and, you know, and been able to afford to live on better than Navy beans and ice cream uh, that he might've lived longer and, and created God only knows what. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you about to kind of speculate on that a little bit later, but yeah. now uh, on March or no, uh, excuse me, February 18th, 1923 the first yeah. issue of weird tales hit newsstands um and the founders were jc pennyberger and <laughs> jm lassinger what do we know about these founders do we know anything about them because i i i other than their names i didn't really see anything when i was doing research and what who had the idea to do weird tales do we know like where this alchemy of that this thing that became so important started. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Cody, what do you know about the history of it? Uh, not uh, a, a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that uh, um, it, it came out of um, a, uh, I mean, the, the, the pulps, which came out of the dime novels, Mm -hmm. uh were um uh this this hothouse uh for for genres and if you liked pirate romance stories there was a zine that just it was called pirate romance stories and right. and and so the market was and, and every every railroad brakeman had a had a you know dime novel or a pulp 
uh, in their back pocket. And so these were things that attempted to make popular literature for every walk of life. And so, um, yeah, it's, I, I think it was inevitable that, that, uh, somebody would have come up with, uh, a, this, this unique cross genre formula, but I, I didn't get a sense that they really knew what it was going to be until they found these contributors, you know, uh, Lovecraft was, it was, it was the perfect marriage of, of artist and venue. Uh, and it was at Lovecraft's suggestion that they went out and, you know, get Clark Ashton Smith and, and Howard, who was already, I think at the time, uh, well on his way to being the, the, one of the, the highest paid, uh, pulp fiction writers, uh, in America, because he was writing, writing Westerns and writing, uh, two-fisted adventure tales and these historical tales and poetry. And, uh, and, and so when weird tales came along, it was the, uh, it, it was just uh, a, a lightning rod uh, during a, uh, a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I, so the first editor was Edwin Baird, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, he's the one that first bought a Lovecraft story for Weird Tales. So even though uh, Farnsworth Wright gets a lot of the attention as the weird, as like the kind of seminal Weird Tales editor, but it was, Baird, but it sounds like he was taking suggestions from the writers like oh you got to get this person you got to get this person yeah. i wasn't i i thought howard had started with weird tales so it, it's interesting to hear that he was writing ahead of that but i guess that makes sense yeah and he was doing some amateur press before that some amateur um uh, journals mm -hmm. and um uh baird he he my, when you read some of the letters of lovecraft i think he liked baird you know, and I and I think and uh, I'm sorry to butt in, but you were you were no, getting no, there that it do. sounds like Baird was very open to say, hey, what do you got? And, and I think he had a very open idea. And like Cody was saying, it was sort of developing as they put this together. So I think the impression I got was Baird was very open, was very, oh, yeah, let me look at this. Let me look at this. Um, Farnsworth had, you know, Lovecraft didn't have a high um level of respect for Farnsworth. And there was a lot of, it, when you read the letters, there was a decent amount of animosity. Um, and I think Farnsworth was just functioning as an editor. And um, Lovecraft was, you get the impression that when it was done, it was done and, and it didn't need to be modified at all. And I think that generated a lot of animosity between the two of them. And it seems right. like Farns, well, Farnsworth think... wanted to shorten things. He wanted everything concise yeah. and short. And Lovecraft yeah. is just yes. starting to learn to expand, right? Right. Well, and it does. It does need to be noted that uh, uh, if not for, I mean, uh, once again, more capable and fit. <coughs> um, uh, Lovecraft was offered the editorship of of Weird Tales uh, after Baird left, and uh, this was when he was in New York. Uh, uh, and his, his only reason was much as he hated New York, he could not imagine moving to Chicago. And yeah. if he only. So the temperament, uh, of a writer, I mean, a, a, of an editor, uh, it is a very different animal from, uh, from writing. But if you read supernatural horror and literature, he articulates brilliantly, uh, what, what few editors, you know, could about what makes a great story and uh so th this you know you, you could file it under any number of other lives that lovecraft could have lived that if he could have pulled up stakes with sonia and moved to chicago uh he could have been the guy that shaped weird tales and made it what it was uh they ended up taking uh giving right the job uh when lovecraft uh failed to failed to rise to the occasion um but uh and i don't think that lovecraft ever expressed uh, bitterness that he wasn't the guy running weird tales uh, yeah. and, uh he... and, and baird only lasted one year and he apparently lost a shit ton of money yes. in the magazine yeah yeah so, so. it was rough sailing for that uh uh for that magazine and uh lovecraft uh it's it's so fascinating that uh lovecraft now is remembered as being you know one of the one of the big three uh, that that ran that zine and much as they did as you pointed out 
um, uh, David, uh, Wright ended up rejecting many of Lovecraft's uh, now most highly regarded stories solely on this on the strength of length, which is bizarre because at the time they had such demand for Lovecraft stories that like in 1930, um, while he was still dithering on Whisper and Darkness, you know, they they reprinted uh, Rats in the Walls, you know, and after he passed away. Uh, right went back into the uh, uh, into the stacks and he printed every, every piece of juvenile reprinted every piece of juvenilia and ghostwriting mm -hmm. job that he could get his hands on and Durleth uh, kind of coattailed in by fleshing out uh, the, the Cthulhu mythos on the strength of that on the strength of that demand and that they wouldn't put out you know shadow they, he rejected shadow over Innsmouth and at the mountains of madness uh, and that they wouldn't contemplate serializing those uh is yeah is, that that's a good point that 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 yeah you're right that that blows me away that that didn't cross their mind well and uh this happened with uh, robert e howard and c l yeah. moore as well that they yeah. turned in longer pieces and they they all turned to astounding and in a piece of very crafty a very crafty move tremaine well uh um f orland tremaine who was the editor at astounding was paying these writers on acceptance specifically yeah. because he was trying to steal them away from the regular stable right. of Weird Tales. And um, I don't know that he paid everyone on acceptance, right? but a lot of these authors that he was trying to take away from other magazines, he did pay on acceptance. Because and I am finding conflicting views on <laughs> when you do the research that some authors are like, I wasn't paid on acceptance. And, right. 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 So... You see that Tremaine was trying to get some of these writers away. Now, right. um, Baird went on to, he stayed with the company, weirdly enough, after he lost $51,000 to wow. Weird Tales and was editing Detective Tales magazine. And so he was still with the company and Farnsworth was his assistant. That's how he kind of got that position. And, um, and it's funny because Farnsworth right is definitely looked upon more favorably and there's lots of history out there about him and what he did in his life which is interesting for an editor um but again then again that that happens with you can get information about tremaine and, and john w campbell as well but john w campbell was also a writer and um and had a career as a writer whereas um i don't did yeah farnsworth Wright did too right he did publish a few stories i think a few um, but but few. yeah nothing nothing we really we, we really remember um yeah but but yeah i i um oh god lost my point hold on a second maybe well maybe. and i will say um i do know uh but, tremaine paid lovecraft 315 dollars for um acceptance of at mount oh. of madness which is a lot Oh yeah. Oh, the, the other thing I wanted to wanted to note or, or train spot on uh, is that uh, Lovecraft wrote and submitted uh, at the Mountains of Madness in 1931, and that for all that uh, for all of his work uh, as a ghostwriter and as a writer, uh, apparently his original manuscripts could be notoriously difficult, um, and uh, so Wright might have just thrown up his hands when he saw the the condition of the manuscript not just not just looking at the length or looking at the story itself which is uh right. and, and and you know I, I guess eventually we'll get into discussing the story itself but uh when See. it was <laughs> yeah when it was rejected by by right um uh and it was you know one of a series a, a, a string of his most ambitious works getting shut down he was crushed and he and as with many of his other things, like Case of Charles Dexter Ward, Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, his most monumental stories, when they were rejected by Weird Tales, he didn't peddle them elsewhere. He he felt like that was the only place that was that was just the only place that was liable to, to make a home for his work. And if they wouldn't take it, he didn't even try. And it fell to many of his friends and his colleagues and devotees, people like Henry Kuttner, August Derleth, and Robert Block, to uh, submit these things on his behalf afterwards. And I, I forget who it was, but one of his friends uh, submitted uh, at the Mountains of Madness to Julia Schwartz, a literary agent. And it was Schwartz who placed it with uh, with Astounding. Uh, I so think that, that was Kuttner. Um, and I uh, think it was, 
I think because I think I think that literary agent was his uncle. Ah, um, see, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and, um, and, and they serialized it, and it was a yeah. huge success. Yeah, I, I could be wrong about. I know his uncle was a literary agent. Mm -hmm. Ray Cutter's uncle, was and and Lovecraft didn't use a literary agent after that. Um, 1931. Yeah. I mean, he wrote these two pieces, but two of the biggest pieces of his career. After that, his output kind of tapers off. Up until the very end of his life, he continued to write uh absurd volumes of of letters he would respond to every piece of fan mail every every everything by a by a colleague uh because that was a support network when he wasn't <clears throat> getting the the validation of these of these things coming out and he needed that that to live but not really i mean he lived with his aunts uh who were you know uh the phillips family had declined but they still had enough that he could at least live the life of a pensioner um, so he wasn't really dependent on these on these sales. It was he was he was writing for love and glory. And and when he didn't get it out of the fiction, he put it into those letters. Mm -hmm. And if those stories would have been accepted, uh, he would have been encouraged to keep going. But his his output declined consistently as what he was doing found uh, found it harder and harder to find a home, even in the magazine that that really owed its continued existence to him. Yeah. Now, this is the of, of the five stories we've covered uh, in this series on 30s science fiction. Um, 1931 is the earliest that any of them were written. Um, although Chamblo by C.L. Moore was written in 19, could have been written in 1932. It was probably written in 1933, the same year it was published, um, because it was published in November. And I think it was written early in 33. So Either way, we know at the Mountains of Madness is the oldest of, of the five stories we've covered. Um, yeah. And 1931 um, is pretty freaking old school. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So hold on a second, <clears throat> folks. Let, I'm going to uh, this is where we're going to get into the visual part of the podcast. So if you're listening on audio, um, you can mark the time and go to YouTube. If you're on YouTube, just hang on. Put your uh, 3D glasses on now. Yeah, um, this is the cover of the first issue of Astounding that's taking amazingly long time to load. There's the, the and it was the cover story Wow! in February 1936. Spoiler alert, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, between the three issues, there's a lot of art. And here's yeah. the weird thing. I had a hard time finding credit for who the artist was. In fact, <laughs> I didn't find credit for who the artist was. They were, they were notorious that way. Yeah. And um, it's funny because when Carrie was like, I'm sure there's credit somewhere. And I was like, I don't really think there is. <laughs> you know yeah. Like, yeah. No. I mean, uh, pulp, uh, pulp archivists uh, have, have dug and, and tried to find out. But yeah, it's sometimes impossible to verify and okay and this is the table of contents for the first issue that it was in and um i like that there's a, a another novelette called death cloud yeah um, i don't know um really any of the other authors in this particular issue there's a lot of authors i know cool. in the other other yeah issues. i mean frank belknap long oh wait um, yeah. i'm sorry he's yeah. one yeah, i'm sorry i forgot he was in this one because he's in yeah. uh, He's in the second one as well. No, he he was a mythos writer and wrote yep. a memoir. Hey, hey, cover painting by Howard V. Brown. Mystery solved. Oh, there it is. <laughs> well, but the art inside. The art yeah, inside, and, I'm saying. Yeah, by Elliot, he, yeah, he, Elliot Dodd. Yeah. Junior. Yeah. Okay. Um well, yeah. So yeah, the the only author in here that I knew ahead of time was um Frank Belknap long and um i don't know if you guys want to say anything about him before we get into it. i know he wrote a biography of lovecraft he wrote lots of mythos stories so so he was right in the circle here um yeah. and um he's also in the next issue by the way he had a novelette in the uh second issue that it was serialized in so um but anything you guys want to say about him or yeah i mean he's he, like you mentioned he he wrote a decent amount of mythos stories. Probably his most famous one is the Hounds of Tindalos, um, which is a really, really cool story. I would highly yes. recommend it. Um, yes. And, you know, Lovecraft would borrow some of his 
uh, terms and, and entities. Um, and I mean, that was something that Lovecraft and the other people in his circle would do. They would, they would share ideas, concepts, monsters, entities. Um, and so as when I started reading this stuff in middle school, it was great when you'd see a reference of one thing in a completely different story from a different author. And it, it made your mind just, it, it was just fascinating how you would see the mention of, um, uh, you know, of something that's in a Conan story, all of a sudden be mentioned in at the, whis you know, yes. uh, the whisper and darkness. So stuff yes. like that was very fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, the Lovecraft was a demon for verisimilitude and, and, and for, and for looking for ways to make this thing feel real. Yeah. And actually, I don't know why Weird Tales didn't serialize or consciously or unconsciously to 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 it Sorry. to make this an open source mythos so that it's not just these stories that this one guy's writing. This stuff starts creeping in and you start thinking, you know, maybe there is a Necronomicon. Uh, uh, maybe there is a cult of Cthulhu. And because all of these people, they can only reveal this this hideous gnosis uh, on uh, in, in these cheesy pulp fiction zines. Um, um, uh, and then just to continue on on the table of contents, I'm sorry, yeah, that, that was yeah. an excellent point. But um, and I do wonder why Weird Tales didn't serialize, because if you look at this, they've got a conclusion for a novel called Blue Magic. Yeah. Right? And, and they are starting another one. That's a really smart way to maintain your readership. Is if yeah. you could hook people to keep reading these. Of the stories um, that are in here, the Psycho Power Conquest is the That's my thing. favorite title. Yeah. 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 That's Go a great title. at Winterbottom. Yeah. And uh, um, so that one I might go back and, and read just to see what that's about. Um, although Death Cloud is a great story too. And um, uh, and you can see this is uh, 20 cents was yeah. how much this, this issue cost. And let's see the artwork for this um hold on uh oh i do have some ads to um let's look at some of the ads that were in this this issue these are fun um typewriter your power with uranium suppositories <laughs> uh, rheumatism free trial relief work for uncle sam uh, stop your your rupture worries. Uh, Piles, don't be cut until you try this wonderful treatment. Oh my God! Yeah, and then uh, let's see. There was that was. There, th th this is some of my favorites. Um, start a potato chip business. I made a wow. joke on Facebook the other day that no one seemed to think was that funny. Where I said, "Well, we all know John F. Ruffle was a huge uh, Lovecraft fan." Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I thought that was funny, but no one really. That's that's that. where maybe that's where Gene Wolf got started. Yeah, here's a here's a queer way to learn music. <laughs> wait, why why the emphasis? Hey, okay, way to bury the lead. Why is the emphasis on learn and not queer? Right, here's right. a queer way to learn music. No, wait, get back to the queer part, buddy. Yeah, um, tire prices cut. Now, I asked Alec Neville Lee in our um, episode about Rule Eighteen, and he said that. Uh, Astounding had no control over the ads. They were they were bought and sold through yeah. Smith and Street, and they all the same ads appeared in all the pulps. Yeah, so. somehow under Campbell, Campbell almost developed became notorious as like a Doctor Oz of his day, <laughs> uh, flogging a lot of bullshit. Yes, bullshit. Yeah. Patent he he seemed to get behind a lot of these. Um, oh yeah, no the the human potential potential movement was uh was was very big with him this is the first piece of art that appeared before the first page oh that's fantastic yeah and it was a queer state of sensations being in the um uh, lee of vast silent pinnacles where ranks shut up like a wall reaching the sky at the world's rim um i don't know who wrote these captions but um and this is why i didn't know who did the art because i right. kept expecting credits here <laughs> oh no no yeah yeah uh, in 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 the uh, uh 
Arctic landscape, uh, Lovecraft, who frequently would reference visual artists uh, as a as a frame of reference, and clearly, you know, uh, tipping his hat to uh, the visual influences. I, I, I there was Cuban, K U B I N. Uh, his his landscapes were were referenced, and his work has like an otherworldly kind of like German romantic vibe. Uh, but it's these landscapes utterly devoid of any human frame of reference. And it's almost just geometric shapes of just ice uh, uh, under, under this very faint pale sunlight. And so it could easily be another, another planet. Um, right. But they're, yeah, they're, they're a great key to, to peeking into, into Lovecraft's head and getting a fuller, fuller uh, perception of, uh, of the picture that he's painting. All right, and this is the first page, um, part one, a gripping word picture in <laughs> of science and a lost world. Wow. Um, a gripping word picture. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he was notoriously not happy with this edit um, yeah. overall and uh, apparently hand-corrected a copy that August Derleth used to use the hand notated corrections right from uh his personal copy um to fix it um all right so issue two here's the cover from the second issue that appeared in not mentioned on the cover entropy wow. by nat Sch Sch i don't even know how to pronounce that it's like schneider Schna that's shocker Schachner. Yeah. Schachner. Anyways, this is a cool cover, but um, for March 1936. And um, uh, not sure entirely what's going on here because I didn't read that story. Um, but let's look at the table of contents for part two. Um, here it is. Sorry. They got saved, Goofy. All right. Here's the table of contents. Um, I'm going to make it a little bigger. So Entropy, the feature novel. Um, I don't know. It looks like the whole thing was in there. Um, and then a novelette called The Roaring Blot by Frank Belknap Long Jr. Um, and that one says like a story of cosmic force, which was interesting. So I think that one was kind of like a cosmic horror piece there. Um, the only other author of interesting note here is stanley g weinbaum um i don't know if you guys are familiar with stanley g weinbaum but he was a member of robert block's milwaukee science fictioneers um he was a part of that group and he was the one that they all was the first to publish out of that group um and the most widely published of that group and he wrote a classic story called The Martian Odyssey, which is considered to be one of the first times that there was like a really relatable alien characters. And he was known for making um, alien characters that um, character driven stories about aliens. Now, here's the interesting thing about Stanley Weinbaum. He died December 14th, 1935 at 33 years old. Uh, one year into the Milwaukee Fictioneers group existing, the, the guy they all look to died at 33 years old. I do not know what caused his death, although in Robert Block's autobiography, Around the Block, he talks about Weinbaum being a hero to all of them in Milwaukee, which the other famous science fiction writer out of that group, of course, was Frederick Brown whose story arena was made into um, the Gorn episode of Star Trek. Um, and Frederick Brown, of course, wrote a famous Martian story, which a lot of people feel was like, a, it was written in the 50s as a tribute to Weinbaum. But if you look at this story, it mentions Weinbaum's death and says the last story of this great science fiction writer, remember him when you're reading this. So they were acknowledging the fact that he died. And I find that really interesting part of this one. Uh, sorry, a little side note. But because of Block's importance in the Lovecraft circle, the fact that Weinbaum was one of his heroes, 
um, I do think is, is something that's a really fascinating thing about this second issue that um, mm -hmm. Mountains of Madness appeared in. So um, sorry about that aside, but I think that was val that's an val valuable aside. So part two artwork. I like this one a lot um, when it loads. Um, this was the artwork for the second part and i don't know what's going on in this art but it looks like they're collaging a couple pieces well it's it's i mean the, in, in the foreground you've got they've got the elder things and a luscious shoggoth uh yeah. with the city in the background the city's not really looking so outre it almost looks like a monastery in tibet yeah but uh but yeah no that's still wonderful mm -hmm. um the effect of the monstrous sight was indescribable. Some fiendish violation of natural law. Oh my god! Yeah, and then and then the art and the aliens are all like yip 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 yip. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yip, yip, right. Yip. Then, <laughs> then it has a up to now. Previously, oh, that's <laughs> madness. Yeah. Some uh, guys went down there, and it was cold, and there was some dead stuff, but it wasn't dead. Yeah, I read the. I read this this morning the uh, the update and um it's funny to see it condensed it, it is interesting and by the way all these are on the internet archive and i will have the link and all the show notes so people can go and look at these um issues if they want to um it, it's really fascinating to read the entire magazines and look at the ads yes. and throughout this series i'm 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 putting all the links so everybody can look at them and uh it is really fascinating to to see uh the ads now let's see part three has a, a lot of art um this was the art that went with the first page of part three. Oh, i guess i should have done the cover we'll that come back to this let's gorgeous. do the cover cover for and the table of contents for episode three i skipped sorry um Again, he wasn't on the cover. Um, the Spawn of Eternal Thought by Iando Binder, which was a pen name by two brothers who wrote science fiction, Andrew and Otto Binder. Um, and they apparently were very popular in the 30s and 40s, but they were writing science fiction up through the 60s um when andrew binder died in 1965 um however their most popular period was the 40s they were very popular in the 40s so i admit i never heard of them before and have never read them so i will try to fix that at some point um let's see so table of contents for three let's All right, so that was a two-part novel, the Binder one. Outlaws of Callisto by Manly Wade uh, Wellham, who was a, a well-known uh, science fiction writer who received the Lifetime Achievement Award at the World Fantasy Awards in 1980. So he uh, kept it going. Um, but his Outlaws on a Jupiter Moon story um, was one that I kind of made a note that I want to go back and read because I think that sounds like fun. Um, and then the other stories, there's one called White Adventure, <laughs> which is interesting. And let's see what it says. Uh, uh, which deals with catastrophe and the Cosmo Trap. There's a story called the Cosmo Trap. It's kind of a neat name. <laughs> But I think the only two authors that I really, uh, the Indo Binder and the Manly Wade Wellman were the only ones that I could really find anything about them yeah, going on and, and doing. And that's a huge departure for Wellman, who's who's more well known for his 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 folk tales uh, of uh, uh, Silver John, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, this wandering minstrel fighting these Appalachian folk monsters and stuff. And so, yeah, uh, with, with Wellman, uh, that that is a, a big departure from his wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. But a lot of if you were a working professional pulp guy, then you went where the work is. Yeah. And, and I think that style that he developed of those those folky style from according to what I read about him, it kind of came in the 50s, I think. Yeah, that could yeah. be wrong about that. 
Yeah, and he was still doing it up until the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, so this, again, I already went out of order, but this is the artwork for uh, part three. Um, and then came a sound, a horrible sound, which enab um, enabled us to run like mad for some outer air. I don't know what that means, but you can see at the bottom... <laughs> There's yeah. people running um, through that beautiful noir landscape. Hurting. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of cool art. I like that one. Yeah, that, that shading is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And let's see. There's a whole bunch of art in this last. Um, oh, wait. I, that was the wrong one. I think we already did that one. Yeah, we did that one. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of art for this one um and i didn't even save all of it but here's it was very very clearly the blasphemous city of mirage in stark objective reality <laughs> um and again this is you know elder things i i suppose and then there's this kind of rock surface whatever from what i could tell the artwork didn't necessarily match the page directly right um but uh and this is in the back of the issue where it we're in the 140 pages here um and then let's see this one i like this one a lot that is um, beautiful yeah and it has like the city and there's some flying creatures here, and then the the I think that's a is that a Yog Sagoth or some kind of elder? No, thing? those are no, it's elder things. Elder they, things flying. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then um, and I like how you got this like kind of trail going here mm -hmm. of the creatures flying up, um, which you don't notice at first. It looks like a path, but then you see like the flying creatures there. So yeah, that that's beautiful. And that was one page after the last one we looked at. They were like on the same page. Cramming it there, but could yeah. be depicting their exodus from Earth for their after their uh after their their last post Shagath rebellion uh, uh period. Yeah. And um so here's the thing. Uh okay, that's the last of the art I've got. So um yeah, it's just back to our faces. So, um, <laughs> oh God, I'm oh sorry. no, we're so sorry. What hideous, hideous objective reality? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, was this his first like old one city that he wrote about, or had he done this before? That's my first question before we get into the story itself. Um, because I think this is the first, as far as I remember, this is the first time he's like really writing about this like uncovered. Well, of the I mean, no, I mean, arguably the first mythos story, uh, the nameless city. Uh, That's true. Is, okay, is, is kind of you. You could look at it as kind of a sketch for this, uh, yeah. for this 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 kind of monomyth that he wanted to tell. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, Call of Cthulhu ends with the, the Rillet, discovery, yeah. the uncovering of uh, of Rillet. and so this was a, a I think a, persist, a persistent theme, uh, and and this was the one where he finally brought all of his forces to bear on it and really fleshes it out. Um, but see, yeah, and this... that's my bad memory because my memory of of Call of Cthulhu was that he talked about the city awakening, but I I didn't remember if we actually saw it. In the oh, story. we we do through I mean through the means of I mean it's a secondhand tale. He's recounting this description by uh, the uh, survivor of the uh, smack, the fishing smack Alma, uh, and and so it's a, it's a traveler's tale, or or even worse, a fisherman's tale. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're, we're we we do vividly get to go there and and bear witness uh, to the uh, to the 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 unveiling um so yeah i i think uh with with at the mountains of madness he was trying to do something that he had attempted before um on on this really grand scale and uh and, and pulls out all the stops uh in that i mean so much of the action 
of, of the thrust of the story is essentially these two archaeologists or, or two naturalists uh, speed reading this this long like visitor center uh, hieroglyphic message uh, explaining the entire history of the elder things race and um, they're able to uh, I mean yeah they put Howard Carter to shame they're able to to translate the whole thing and get the whole gist of it and just at the point when you're you're frustrated and you're feeling like this entire story is these guys uncovering these hideous secrets of something that happened hundreds of millions of years before, then it rushes in with this this urgency, which is depicted in the the that cover shot from the first issue uh, and uh, that interior illustration, and then it becomes this very immediate uh, race, and uh, and uh, it it beautifully pays off. Uh, the diligent reader's uh, uh, willingness to uh, to follow to follow it through to its conclusion. Which is funny because when you said spoiler alert, it's like I don't think that happens in the first part. So if you're reading the first part and you're like, oh what no, is, when is that happening? <laughs> you know, I yeah. If I was buy the, the next issue, <laughs> if I was the editor, I would have gone with the autopsy scene, which to my mind is the most uh, uh, penetrating, you know, and and shocking moment maybe in in all of Lovecraft. Uh, in that, uh, and it's just the scene that he kind of dryly recounts uh, again secondhand. But uh, when the the they find the first frozen specimens of these elder things, um, and they start dissecting them, they're not even sure that these are you know they're trying to grasp that these are sentient beings. But their their closest terrestrial relatives are like crinoids, like proto mm -hmm. proto plants. Uh, and as they're cutting these things open and, and they're making all these incredible discoveries they're unaware that the things that they are are dissecting aren't really dead and so you know they the, the men on the expedition return back to the base camp and find it ravaged and the uh forensic pathologists have been murdered but they haven't just been murdered they've been dissected because these things woke up and quite rationally weren't motivated by a sense of revenge so much as curiosity the same curiosity that motivated us to dissect them they turn this in this in this turnabout they they cut us open to find out what we are what makes us tick you know what's interesting about the scene you're talking about cody is that because we don't really think of lovecraft as like you know having like the kind of normal suspense beats that say for example like a 50s writer like richard matheson is known for that richard right. matheson or stephen king later on would, would build suspense and do these things but that scene is a really great reveal and mm -hmm. and 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 really um shows great craft um as far as suspense yes. and 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 making a reveal which by yeah. the way when we were doing who goes there yesterday and um uh tim levin and no i think it was mary san giovanni brought it up but but we were talking about the no it was tim tim brought up the scene where they blew, where they blew up or they ignited in who goes there where they they ignite the fire by accident and then it the light from the fire reveals the other aliens trapped yeah. in another part of the ice yeah and we think of these kinds of reveals like i'm wondering how much that scene in campbell was influenced by well no he i think he would have written who goes there before this one came out uh, um, probably but, very close yeah they're they were very close, close to each other so it's hard yeah. to say who goes there came out in 38 uh and but he, he wrote it in 36 yes and campbell has uh, campbell ha has gone on record in saying yeah he he'd read at the mountains of madness and it quite possibly influenced the 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 location uh yeah. but uh, as you uh, as you mentioned uh, uh before we even started uh the brain stealers from mars uh who goes there is 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 a reformatting of that idea that he I'm sorry, Cody. You're breaking up a little bit. He might have. He might have been mountains of madness. Oh shit! I'm sorry. So you back. broke up. So repeat that point yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, can well have been influenced to uh, the story in Annika. Uh, so, Lovecraft story is very fertile, but it really have. Uh, until the very end, it doesn't really use those those suspenseful uh, those suspenseful tools uh, to make the most of it. And who goes there? I I, I think made it much more immediate. Um, but uh, but uh, again, I think about 
uh, I, and I haven't read who goes there in quite a while, but uh, I remember the blood test scene, um, which in, in Carpenter's uh, film is the, you know, the most tense uh, scene in one of the most tense movies ever made. And mm -hmm. uh, Campbell kind of recounts, it's like, they did the blood test and son of a gun, <laughs> half of the 100 guys turned out to be things. Uh, and, and they just, and then just kind of, and they killed them and they moved on. And it's like, if, imagine that that scene where Palmer freaks out and and they he ends up killing that other guy and it's just an utter fiasco that happening 50 times right <laughs> um right. uh it it and so yeah Campbell's Campbell's thing left some room to exploit too but I I think I think Campbell might have lifted uh the the idea for the setting but beyond that I think it was it's it's an own animal and kind of a yeah uh, coincidence Right, right. And, and um, I, you're right, though, with imitation uh, slash brain stealers from Mars, he was kind of floating with those ideas beforehand. Yeah. And um, so we've been kind of been working on that. So the way the, uh, the Mountains of Madness starts, it starts off with a very Lovecraftian crutch with the <laughs> um, I am forced into speech because men of science have refused to follow my advice without knowing why. <laughs> It is altogether against my will that I, you know, that I tell my reasons for, he's going through the whole, like, I'm telling you this because, and I don't want to, and, uh, and you will go insane if I tell you all this, that crutch. And what's interesting to me is one of the things that I like about it, Mountains of Madness is he uses less of those crutches that he had throughout his career. <laughs> it's hilarious that the first paragraph is a huge one. Right. And it's it's funny. He's saying, I'm telling you this so you don't go to the Antarctic. And you're thinking this is the exact reason why scientists would then go to the Antarctic. Like if he said, you know what? We just found ice. That's it. There's just ice. Nothing else. <laughs> like if he said that, people would be like, all right, well, then why go? You know? Yeah. And um, yeah, it's funny. I, I got a kick out of that part, you know, and certainly if you're turned off by some of those crutches, you could easily read that first part and be like, Oh no, I'm not, I'm not going here. But if you stick with it, he, he does show a lot more of the things that, you know, in a lot of the early stories is just, it's so undescribable. I can't, I can't even tell you. And then I do feel like he's explaining a lot more in this. Yes. Yeah. It's in almost this. like a scientific it, documentary at some point. Yeah. And, um, so uh i will say that the language in it is is pretty old school there is a two sally forth um that is used unironically in this story um and uh so unlike you know like we talk about i am legend or like who goes there stories that hold up really well and don't seem particularly dated quite to the era i think at the mountains of madness is very dated to the era but i actually think it's one it's a feature not a bug um of the story i think um that's good for this one um i like there's a part um it is absolutely necessary for the peace and safety of mankind that some of earth's dark dead corners and unplumbed depths be left alone lest sleeping abnormalities wake to resurgent life and blasphemously surviving nightmares squirm and splash out of their black layers to newer and wider conquests. As one of my favorite paragraphs in the, in the book. Um, because as much as we make fun of some of the purple bros of Lovecraft, it's some of the things that we also love at the same time. <laughs> you yes. Know? Yeah. It's uh, that I found that paragraph badass. Um, and I like the idea that he's saying like, hey, there's some parts of this planet we just don't want to know about. And we yeah. should just leave that to yourselves. And I know what you're saying, Fred. Like, that's going to be what scientists are going to be like. Yeah, that's what, that's what they're going to go for. Well, I can handle it. But and then here comes the yeah, uh, Prometheus it's... space snake debate. <laughs> 1931. Um, <laughs> right. And, um, you know, would scientists not try to have more precautions that they go following these guys but one thing that's really interesting about right. the story too is that i found it interesting that they were talking about the people back home following them their progress on wireless <laughs> right because they're talking about radio mm -hmm. yeah. but when you just read that it's kind of like huh 
that's something I wasn't expecting in this reread. Um, and yes, I reread it last month uh, for this. And um, I read at the Mounds of Madness, like everyone in my age, when the cover, the Michael Whelan color, cover with the ghostly figure lifting up the shirt with all the bones, um, that cover like was enough to get like a lot of people in the 80s to buy the Lovecraft yeah. Del Rey editions. And um, uh I don't know why I don't have that edition. This is the one that I've had since the nineties or whenever this edition came out. But, um, but yeah, uh, that, you know, I, I don't know that, that the wireless thing was interesting to me. Like, what do you guys think about starting with Cody? Like how important the thirties setting is to this. And especially considering that, We've come close to getting at the Mountains of Madness movies, and I don't know if they were going to modernize it or do period. Me personally, period all day. Keep it in the 30s, especially because Antarctica is not going to be as mysterious of a thing these days right. as it right. would be then. What do you think, Cody? Uh, well, I, as I understand, Del Toro's uh, take on it was supposed to be period. Yeah. Um, the script I read was from the 90s, yeah. Yeah, and it and it uh, included you know kind of more uh, kind of actiony set pieces, almost kind of incorporating some Jurassic World kind of action set, uh, stuff, which uh, for a blockbuster film is is going to be expected. But uh, it was definitely going to be a uh, a, a horror story, um, and, and he'd uh, commissioned. Uh, concept art by wayne douglas barlow and bob eggleton and and, uh and mike mignola and um i once uh at a at a uh panel uh announcing the first hellboy movie at san diego comic-con uh he was uh holding forth about that and people were just over and over again standing up and asking ron perlman to say oh crap and uh and and uh, i when i i i got up and he had earlier on in the thing mentioned that he was still working on at the mountains of madness and i was like yeah hellboy that's great thanks but what what can you tell me about at the mountains of madness and like a groan went through the whole room like 500 people were like oh come on and uh, but but he, he 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 was into it yeah it, well, you corner and you would jack off and you die uh it was I, I think his uh, uh, his his description of it um, kind of cleaned up for for daytime audiences, but but yeah, I think absolutely the the 1930s period was important because it was the latter end of the golden age of exploration, and I I, I think the 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 hubris because of this technology and this false sense of connection to the the outside world. Oh yeah, the, we're, we have a we we have a wireless thing. We're we're in touch with them. We're we're not so com- Uh, Cody, I important because all right. we're doing it again. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? I think okay. you actually in the recording, I think it comes out. I just didn't. I don't, I'm not hearing you. Oh, I think right. in the recording, it'll come right, out. Right. I, I think, um, I mean, at the time, uh, Abe Merritt. Hold on, Cody. I think I. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, sorry yeah. to do this to you. I'm gonna pause the recording. Okay. And... All right. Sorry, folks. We had some technical difficulties. We're back on. Cody, go. Okay. So yeah, I, I I think absolutely the the technology that they did have at the time uh, created this false sense that yeah we're we're ready to to uh, plot out these last corners of the uh, blank corners of the map. And, and so I think if it would have been later, as you said, yeah, Antarctica is not so mysterious. And uh, changing, hopelessly changing that, that environment without even meaning to. And so that was this, this era when humanity was perilously certain that they had mastered the world mm-hmm. and yet still didn't understand what they were dealing with and I, I think after you know after we have nukes a lot of these things change in scale because yeah if we find this horrible city down at the bottom of the world 
uh, and it's an alien peril. Well, and, and, and many stories in the 1940s and stuff kind of kind of do this. We'd nuke it. There's a story called Spawn of the Green Abyss. I forget the author, but it's kind of a rehash of uh, Call of Cthulhu in which these, you know, these these uh, monsters from the bottom of the ocean attack San Francisco Bay and the army kicks their ass. And so there's this sense that, yeah, there, by the by the 40s and 50s, there's a sense that, yeah, science could unleash monsters, but we'll our technology is ready for them because we've got the bomb. And uh, to ratchet as as Campbell did with who goes there to make it something that still can remain uh, inscrutable and remain a, a peril uh, for a world where we think we can we can erase anything that that uh, that looks at as cockeyed. So, Fred, um, I'm wondering how you read at the Mountains of Madness as a as a scientist and where it stands in all of Lovecraft's oeuvre as as a um, curiosity of science meeting science fiction with Lovecraft. And and, you know, I know that's a huge question, but uh... (laughs) no, no, not at all. Um, Yeah, I mean, what? It's it ha, it's it's probably one of my favorite Lovecraft stories. Uh, this one in the color out of space. Um, and for this one, what I what I I love what Lovecraft did was he created a very unique alien. You know, it's not someone with a pair of antennas on, um, but at the same time, it's something that's recognizable. That it's. It's something that has radial symmetry. So it's related to like echinoderms, starfish, sea urchins, but yet it's very different. And even its reproductive cycle is more like a fern, which I find fascinating. Here we have this, this thing that can travel through interstellar space. It, it, it has this reproduction cycle that's like a fern and it looks like a highly evolved starfish. And it was just something that really stood out that for being so weird looking, but yet it was presented in a very scientific basis. So, you know, Lovecraft and, and you know, the team, Lake and all the other scientists, they're giving you measurements. They're giving you very highly detailed descriptions. Um, and it's sort of the opposite end of something like the Colorado space where you don't know what the thing is. You don't know if it's sentient. You don't know if it's a chemical or, you know, it, it just affects this farm and goes away. And mm-hmm. where that is just so ambiguous, which I think makes that <laughs> right. Story unique, this one is so utterly detailed, which I, I love because it's just something. And then even, you know, connecting it to the history of life. I mean, Lovecraft had this great one of my favorite quotes in it is of the life of the old ones, both under the sea and after part of them migrated to land, volumes could be written. And that to me speaks two things. One, it's telling me there are all kinds of things that happened in the history of not only the elder things, but all their relationships with the spawn of Cthulhu, with all the other entities they interact with. But in a way you could use that same description to describe life on earth that, right. you know, we, what we know about life on earth, 99% of it comes from fossils. And there was a lot of life that didn't have, you know, calcified bones, mouth parts, exoskeleton that we don't know what existed, that if it wasn't fossilized or preserved in some manner, we just don't know. So I like that quote because it could be thought of with the elder things and it could be thought of as life in general on earth. So I, you know, I could go on and on, but I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I like the quote that I because I like there's one quote where it combines the science science fictiony thing of it with the pulpy in, insanity and mythos. It's during the Jurassic Age of the old ones met fresh adversity in the form of a new invasion from outer space. This time, half fungus, half crustacean creatures, creatures undoubtedly the same figuring in certain whispered legends of the north and remembered in the himalayans as migo or and i i hate this word adopt i always say it wrong abominable snowmen um i love that it's like your myths of snow of the the snowmen and the, and these creatures they 
they're the same ones that created the old ones. And mm -hmm. I love how it ties to mythology, but also uses scientific terms, which Jurassic Age, I mean, it, it, that's a word we know now because Jurassic Park is one of the biggest movies of all time. But at the time, saying that was probably, I'm sure there were people running to their encyclopedias to find out what that right. word was. Right? right. And so at, at the time, that's a pretty big thing. And I'm wondering too, he probably did more explaining of what the old ones were and these things in the letters to and from his circle than he probably did in the stories because people are probably saying like they're wondering the same things I am like are the old ones did were they created on earth or did they start somewhere else did they come here and what I usually come to when I'm reading this and I'm thinking this is I go it doesn't matter I, I don't care I, like it doesn't matter but I'm sure some in his circle were writing him letters saying tell me explain this to me Cody you're, you're muted sorry yeah, uh, uh, that the the way that the cosmology dovetails together between uh, Lovecraft's take on it, you know, with the creation of of of, of life, uh, uh, with the elder things coming here and, and using primordial goo to make shagaths, uh, and then you know, but he in this in this word salad he, he would drop these kind of just insane litanies or prayers like in in uh whisper and darkness it's just the litany from the from the wax cylinder recording uh in uh at the mountains of madness it's the the raving um of of dyer's companion after they look down into into the hole at the bottom of the world uh, you know, he, he throws out these things, the, the proto shagaths, the moon ladder and, and all of this stuff. And, uh, and uh, you know, he would name check Ubo Sothla, who was Clark Ashton Smith's, con one of con Smith's contributions. And Ubo Sothla is seen as the original progenitor of all living organisms. And so the, uh, Ubo Sothla is this uh, embodiment of fecundity that is constantly throwing off these uh, these other organisms. Uh, another one called Aboth that does the same thing. And it is like a like an allegorical embodiment of the life process itself, constantly throwing out variations and mutants and just seeing what works, letting them eat each other, letting them reproduce if they succeed. And uh, standing against all of those, the elder to make us uh to make us understand are are not so different from us you know one of the one of the kind of striking and anachronistic things that he does is he goes you know i Dyer suddenly comes to to uh, appreciate them and understand where they're coming from caves you know uh they didn't want to work uh but but the way that you know these multiple authors working on this thing took it in this continuum from rationalist materialist science looking at the fossil record into folklore and mythology and into creation myths uh is what what make it uh something so durable and so fertile still to this day because it it, it answers all of those questions what we think we know and what we believe about what we can't possibly know so there are parts that you can see in at the mountains of madness and you would know better than me you two both of you where you can see Lovecraft's circle influencing this work. Because I know sure. he name drops uh, class Clark Ashton Smith, which in my reading of it this time, like blew my mind. I was like, whoa, he just name dropped a real person and his paintings yeah. in, into this. Yes. And I wasn't, I didn't remember that or I wouldn't have known that. And like yeah, even the, 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 the cities of the elder things, he mentions um, uh, Rorich, um, the Russian artist, um, he, who has an exhibit in New York City. And um, so Lovecraft went to that exhibit and saw those sort of strange cubistic paintings that he did. And that he even name drops him in the story. So yes. um, and, and that's, you know, again, as someone who was originally reading this stuff in middle school, it was it was confusing and yet fun where you'd see a name. And you'd find out that name was an actual person and then you'd find another name or a concept and that you couldn't find anything on. So he would just mix all this sort of real people, real things with his mythology. And it just made it all the more interesting. 
Yeah, and I know he and Robert Block killed each other in stories like um, The Haunter yes. in the Dark and then yeah. The Shambler Shadow from the from Stars. The steeple. The yeah. Sh- yeah, that's it. Shadow in the Steeple. Yeah, yeah. And, which is cool and fun. Um, and as far as like some of the things that like actually happened in the story and we did a lot talking around the history of it but but that's what i think's interesting for i mean the story is interesting of course but i think what you know so much of what makes this lovecraft's masterpieces is that he's really taking time to like grow and expand in this Mm -hmm. it's not a short story it's the closest we've gotten to a novel and I think that leads to what you were talking about, Cody, was what if Farnsworth Wright had been like, hell yeah, give me long pieces. Yeah. You know, would we have gotten in the 30s like three or four more really long pieces? And I'm not saying we're going to get, you know, Lovecraft's The Stand or anything or Lovecraft's right. Under the Dome. But, right. you know. Um, you know I mean, he I mean, been- he was... He was moving in that direction, shadow out of time, Um, you know, and and they're in the shadow out of time. Some of these other entities are name dropped. Again, another grand um, story that was more of um, transfer of minds. But he was going into this direction of these, you know, like Cody mentioned, these larger, grander tales that required you know, more words to describe and go through, not just like a short, like Dagon or even, um, you know, rats in the walls. Yeah. Yeah. If he, if he would have had more of a facility, and this is one of the things that makes Lovecraft a difficult read. Uh Uh-oh. Again? Yeah, for uh, for me, I don't know. Okay. It records okay. on your yeah. end, so keep yeah. going. Uh, uh, he uh, he wasn't interested in character interaction, uh, a dialogue, and and so the of madness and 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 especially shadow out of time. If he would have gotten deeper into the psychological stuff and actually fleshed out the 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 character interaction between Peasley and his son, for instance. Uh, uh, it could have been a full and grand novel. Uh, his stuff, uh, he didn't, he had off, been offered opportunities to write novels and he wasn't really interested. He liked doing short stories because he saw himself as a dilettante, as a dabbler. If he would have gotten more serious about it, if he would have gotten more positive uh, reinforcement, uh, you know, and if he wasn't such a misanthrope, yes, uh, these these all could have been novels and they could have been grand novels and uh and, and been talked about in in the same breath uh with the the biggest epics of the of the era it's a shame yeah well and it is a shame but you know we got we got the lovecraft that we got and yeah. you know certainly we um should be appreciative that we got the work that that, that we do and yeah. you know look i'm 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 not the lovecraft devotee that you guys are and and i i'm you know it's it's funny because this is the first time I've really sat down to read Lovecraft in probably 20 years, you know, where I, I'm interested in Lovecraft. I'm more, I've been more interested in the last 20 years in reading about him than Mm -hmm. I was in actually reading him. And so this is the first time I sat down and really read something again in a long time. And so, and it was a good feeling and I liked it. um, And I, I appreciated doing it, but you know, he's, he's not always my speed. So, but, but I appreciate the mountains of madness one of the things i really appreciated was the reminder that lovecraft was science fiction because he gets lumped in with horror all the time yeah and um and it's funny because i went overboard in my review because there's a there's a science fiction book club message board on facebook that's like once that's very very well read and i like being i like putting my reviews up there uh because i can't get a lot of clicks but if I post something that they think is science fiction, there's more horror than science fiction, they, they take it off and they'll always say like, it's horror. And I was so worried. I was like, you are not going to take this down for being horror because yeah, it's science fiction and it was published in astounding and it's science fiction. God damn it. Yeah. And, 
Um, and first of all, like I hate the narrowing of the definitions anyway. Science fiction mm-hmm. and horror should be blending all the time. So um, yes. and 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 for for the idea that you're going to, you know, just categorically decide that something is is only one or or the other is, is just annoying to begin with. Um, but the last things that I really want to, you know, and I'm going to let you guys talk more here at the end, but the last thing that I really want to say about where this fits into the canon and what's going on in the thirties, because this is the fifth episode of this series and I've been doing this for a bit. And, 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 you know, the whole thing started when I, I read a CL, the collection of CL Moore stories of the Northwest Smith. And I started thinking about like what it means to be writing science fiction in this decade. And it's easy to write off this decade is old timey, right? Yeah. And forget when you read a C.L. Moore story and you see how much like how lurid the stories are, right? Um, and you see mm-hmm. like, it's easy to forget that people were living their lives just like they are now here at that time. And this was a groundbreaking era, especially the late thirties for science fiction. This is the birth of the golden age. And this story exists before the so-called golden age of science fiction, but it is one of the things that created it because this story had such an influence on a whole generation of writers. And the fact that Lovecraft is still influencing writers is still inspiring Cthulhu mythos all over the place. It, it stands in the canon. And the reason I bring this up is because with each of these stories, I want to at least at some point explain why I think this story is in the canon. It's one that has to be read. If you're someone who wants to understand the canon of science fiction and understands what it means, you may not like Lovecraft, but you have to read certain pieces. And I think At the Mountains of Madness, Call of Cthulhu, uh, probably... Uh, shadow uh, or um, color out of space are ones that are important ingredients of what became science fiction and his role as a weird tales stable writer made him that before any of the cthulhu plushies or whatever has happened now or the lovecraft film festivals or whatever have now what he did then is so important and uh, i just wanted to put that out there and I'm, and then I will leave it to you guys to bring us home <laughs> with uh, how do you feel about where At the Mountains of Madness stands in the canon of Lovecraft and in the canon of the genre in general, starting with Cody? Right. I, I think, well, first of all, I think At the Mountains of Madness forms like the, 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 the spine or the backbone of the, of the mythos, whereas, you know, Call of Cthulhu is its heart. And it's all feeling and effect and mystery. Uh, uh, at the mountains of madness is is actually a very it it it, it interrogates this this monomyth uh, to its logical conclusion, and I think uh, in that sense, and and it's the it, it's the most hybrid thing uh, highlights one of the uh, most important things I did along with this open source world mythology. Um, is that he in he reinforced that science fiction uh could have of uh, of feeling and and philosophy and it's an outlier in terms of that era pulp is usually reacting against you know the the times it's offering refuge from a world that uh is you know that that doesn't care how you feel and so so much of science fiction was very positivist and, and showing, you know, the grand things that human beings were going to achieve and bending nature and the universe to our will. And so I think he's the outlier that's so important there that is is saying, you know, what you feel. And the world is unguessably old and strange and everything. very all too often rather facile and uh and callow uh takes on on the universe and fate he, he reminds us how big and how unguessably old it is and uh, whenever i read you know science fiction like uh peter watts blind sight was one of the last things that i read recently that really without explicitly 
name checking the Lovecraft mythos gives you that sense of the unguessable age and strangeness of the universe and the futility of trying to conquer it or perhaps even understand it. Uh, and I think uh, bringing that, that, uh, that science fiction into horror, which is even more important because horror all too often degenerates into a genre of things when it should be a genre of effect. And it can be about anything where there is fear and wonder. Um, and so I think he did so many wonderful things in that period uh, with his own mythos, but also, you know, defining what these kinds of stories could be about and how they could make you feel that it, it resonates in spite of all of the, uh, the flaws or shortcomings or just anachronisms, things that didn't jibe with that era or, or any era. Um, but but yes, I, I, I think it's absolutely critical to understanding uh, science fiction and what it can be, if not just what it typically is. Mm. Fred. Yeah. Um, and, and this was touched on earlier, uh, how the science fiction during this period of time, a lot of it were space opera um, where, you know, you mastered um, the universe. You you're flying through space. You have all this technology. Um, and when you look at Lovecraft's letters, he was, you know, he was not a fan of that type of fiction. He, he, he would say, oh, it's, you know, the, he would call it space opera. And it was, this, it was very, you know, routine and it was the same story. And, um, you know, he, he brought that, so that wonder and horror of the unknown uh, into science fiction, but then he also put a lot of science in the science fiction. I mean, when you go over and how he, and one of the complaints of At the Mountains of Madness is how much it goes into the science of, you know, getting the equipment to, to Antarctica, the, the, uh, the technology that they were using, the way they were boring in through the ice and the glaciers, um, you know, the description of the elder things. I mean, there's a lot of biology, there's a lot of physics, astronomy, a little bit of astronomy, a little bit of chemistry, but you know, there's a lot of that, which really that in, a, in the story helps to build up that realism. Uh, and I think a, a good quick anal an analogy is, you know, where a lot of science fiction was sort of Star Trek, Star Wars, this was like the alien, you know, this was the, you know, it's, hey, we don't know what's out there. And if we come across it, we have no idea what it's gonna do to us. We don't know what's gonna happen. And Lovecraft really presented that. And he presented it without even going out into space, you know, staying right here on Earth. Um, and if you think about it, the Elder Things really at that point, they weren't aliens. They were residents on the Earth. They were here long before humanity was. So they, you know, in a way, they were some of the original Terrans on Earth. Right. Well, um, Guys, I really appreciate your time and um, talk to me about At the Mountains of Madness. Um, this was a great way to close out this series. Um, uh, I didn't really intentionally mean to do the oldest story last, <laughs> but that's the way it ended up happening. Um, I also think it's one of the most crucial of, of the period. Um, uh, although I think all five in their own ways. Um, and uh, uh you know play a role in what uh canon does um so uh cody can you tell people how they can find your work or find you if they want to if you want them to well online certainly uh one could go to codygoodfellow.com uh which uh, uh is uh updated periodically with uh new things uh as you noted uh my third novel, Perfect Union, is due to be reissued uh, end of this month by Ghoulish Books. And uh, I, I will be hosting a uh, Cthulhu prayer breakfast in Portland on October 7th. Um, and uh, I periodically do those things at, uh, as you said, at Necronomicon. Uh, uh, the Lovecraft Film Festival, um, or, or possibly your bar mitzvah or wedding. Uh, just reach out to me through uh, CodyGoodFellow.com. Uh, I, I do have a card and I can perform weddings. Yeah, I would love to see you at a bar mitzvah. That would be... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Today I, today I am a deep one. Yeah, and uh, Fred, how can people <laughs> find your work? 
So um, you can go to Lovecraftian Science um, at Word. Press.com. Also, you can reach out to me at um, F Lubno, L U B N O W, at PrincetonHydro.com. Um, and um, I gave a pre about an hour presentation at the last Necronomicon on linking up the history of the elder things with uh, um, mass extinction events on Earth. So if you want a copy of that, I can send you a PDF. If you want, I can send that out to you. I, um, I want it. Okay, I can send that to you, and then send it to um, me back in time to before I wrote Radiant Dawn, which is a, <laughs> there we go. a novel based on the at the Mountains of Madness cosmology. Because I probably I probably spilled a few things. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yes. We do have a couple volumes of Love the Journal of Lovecraftian Science, and I'm working with both our editor and our publisher to get volume three out. So um, if anyone's interested in that, feel free to email me. Yeah, and if you want to send anyone back in time, I'm available because. I might be able to be the one uh, I could like also warn myself about certain things when I take it to Cody back in time. Um, that, uh, that'll but, end well. Yeah. Yeah. That will. End well. Yeah. Um, well guys, uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining me on uh, postcards from a dying world and um, yeah. Enjoy Lovecraft. Uh, thanks folks. <laughs>